Good afternoon, everybody. Happy Monday. Here with uh, Paul and Josh and Rob Simulcare. Rob is the chairman of the Connecticut Lottery uh, Corporation. Um, you'll hear from him in a few minutes. Uh, brief uh, daily summary update. Um, this is numbers since Friday. I think you can see we're closing in on 300,000 COVID cases. And uh, these are the ones we know about uh, really over the last year. And as you know, early on, there was not nearly much testing. Um, still doing a lot of tests. The positivity rate uh, ticked up just a little bit. We're seeing some of the same in uh, New York and Massachusetts. All stay within a narrow band. Um, still pretty stable. Um, watch out for Miami Beach. I see a lot of uh, spring um, uh, events going on down there. And uh, make sure if you went down there, don't go. Stick around here. The weather's been great. Um, and if you happen to have gone down there, get tested before you come back. Get tested at Bradley Airport and to make sure you're okay. Um, I see a lot of people running around there. Uh, hospitalizations continue to go down. Deaths at nine, remember that's a three-day number. So um, it's, I think, good news that that number continues to go down. Hospitalizations and fatalities, the key metric that we've been focused on, especially in this time of vaccination. Where are we on the vaccine update? Uh, over half of our folks, 45 and above, have now been vaccinated, at least had their first dose. Um, uh, 75 and above is almost 80 percent. Um, I think you can see 36 percent of all adults um, over the age of 16 have uh, received their uh, first dose, 36 percent. And uh, we figure, like I said, during the early days, we had a lot of people uh, get infected on top of the um, you know, 300,000 cases we know. So there's a lot of folks who have some sort of antibody built-in immunity. So that, that gives us a little bit of protection uh, over and above the percentage of people who have been vaccinated. It's like a, um, a natural governor to what's going on, uh, unlike this guy. And I think uh, that's going to make a difference uh, uh, going forward. And that's why our trend lines continue um, downward and all the key metrics that make a difference. And that's why... We have 45 and above has been open. We had, um, you know, I think it was 80,000 appointments made uh, since Friday morning. 22% of all the people of 45 and 54 have already been vaccinated their first shot. I said, Josh, that seems like an awful lot in a short period of time. He reminded me a lot of them were um, health care workers, um, uh, educators, and uh, daycare. So they were already in the process of being vaccinated. And that's what we assumed in our, um, our budgeting. I think it's worth noting in the next track, uh, we opened up a little bit differently to vaccinations than uh, other states. Um, we did it in a very methodical way, age-based, narrowed the aperture, so you didn't open it up to everybody, first come, first serve. AP wrote an article recently saying, are those states that opened up too widely, too fast, where you had... Um, Websites crashing, people waiting in lines, nothing there, like South Carolina and Florida. They ended up having a lower percentage of their people ended up getting vaccinated than states like uh, Hawaii and Connecticut and some others that were more focused uh, narrowly in terms of opening it up on a methodical basis. And it's also worth remembering that um, states like Hawaii and Connecticut, which are more age-based, um, a lot higher percentage of our elderly are vaccinated. Unlike some states uh, like South Carolina and Florida, where it's a little more first come, first serve, some, they skew younger. So that's made a big difference for us in terms of, again, fatalities and hospitalizations. And that's made a difference, as this next uh, graph will tell you. This was a headline in the Hartford Current, I think just a few days ago. Seniors seen the biggest drops in fatalities and deaths. That's the red line, 80 and above. Same thing as we saw in our nursing homes. It reminds you the vaccines work and the vaccines are safe and they're making an enormous difference, which is why uh, we were able to continue opening uh, cautiously with 100% um, occupancy last Friday. That said, we have to continue our outreach, especially for black and brown populations. Uh, we have some of our towns where you have um, you know, 70% of the eligible population has been vaccinated in some of our cities where it's more like 35 or 40. So we've got to do a better job of uh, getting people vaccinated there. And uh, this is just something we're rolling out now. It's the mobile vaccination vans. We have 35 of them scaling up. Uh, we'll have uh, them 
uh, end of this month and really in April when we get all the vaccines, uh, the widest supply. At the same time, it'll be opened up to everybody without age group on April 5th. These vans will be able to do 160 doses a day. They'll be in the church parking lot at the end of the service. They'll be in other congregate settings, housing. So we're, we're taking the vaccine to you to do everything we can to expand our reach. Um, uh, Susan and I have been to a lot of facilities uh, where we're making calls, dialing out, guiding people to come to get vaccination. And those are part of the equity programs that we're going to be rolling up and ramping up. Uh, we've got in our most socially disadvantaged, vulnerable communities um, that represent about 25 percent of our population. Um, 22 percent of those people have been vaccinated, not quite where we wanted to be. We want to at least be uh, at the state normal or better. So we've got a little ways to go, but we are making progress there. I think let me just change gear. Um, it was a pretty big week last week uh, for the last um, many, many years. Uh, Connecticut has been trying to reach an agreement with our tribal partners, uh, Mohegan Sun and Foxwoods, uh, in order to um, bring our gaming into the 21st century. And uh, if we've learned one thing uh, after a year of COVID is how much of the world is moving into a virtual world. We've seen that in telehealth. We've seen that in teleeducation. Uh, we've seen that in telecommuting. And it was really important both to uh, the state of Connecticut and our tribal partners that we get this right. And we worked hard, um, you know, David and Melissa and Paul and our team, uh, you know, negotiating this. A lot of people said, just do a deal, just make a deal. We wanted a deal that was in the best interests of, um, you know, all three partners, best interests of the taxpayers of the state of Connecticut. And it's sort of uh, three pieces. One, it allows us to get into sports uh, betting. You've seen what they're doing in New Jersey and New Hampshire and um, a few other states. We're ahead of the curve there. That's going to be available both to um, our tribal partners as well as to um, the Connecticut Lottery Corporation. That was important uh, because that means um, it allows us to expand and compete there as well. Online casino gaming, that's an extension of the compact. The, um, the tribes have the exclusive to do casino gaming uh, in real time. Now they also have the exclusive to do real um, online casino gaming in the virtual world. Uh, there um, we get um, a revenue share of 18 going up to 20% after year five. Um, that's going to represent significant um, resources for the state and to our tribal partners, probably um, north of $100 million in um, net cash flow to each of our tribal partners and eventually uh, to uh, the state as well over a period of time. And uh, Rob and his team at the um, Lottery Corporation have the right to move from paper to iLottery and draw games at casino. And that's important. I mean, right now, that business, you know, I didn't focus on it, is a billion-dollar business with about $400 million a year in revenue to the state of Connecticut, which allows us to uh, hold down uh, taxes and invest in key services. So the fact that we'll be able to expand this over a period of time and compete, I think is an important plus for uh, across the state. And we wouldn't be able to do it if we didn't have the right team who were able to uh, take the lead there. I know a lot of people have been um, you know, worrying about some of the quasis and uh, the folks who are leading that. Um, and we had some problems in the corporation lottery going back a few years. We've got a good team. We've got a good team right now. Greg Smith, uh, he's the executive director. Greg has been executive director at other states. He's a really good person to help take the lottery corporation, you know, to the next level in terms of the virtual space and in terms of sports. And in particular, my friend Rob Simulclair, who's been chairman uh, there. You know, Rob has experience at... Um, I think it's ESPN, NBC Sports, a lot of experience in digital media. So I think he's ideally suited to take this major endeavor from the state and bring it into uh, the modern era. Rob, you want to tell us a little bit about what this um, agreement means to the Lottery Commission, what we can expect to see and when? Absolutely. Thank you very much, uh, Governor Lamont. I appreciate it. I, I know when, when you and I first talked about this role at Lottery, this was really the vision that we had when, when we first sat down to talk about the, the chairmanship of this board. And so I, I want to thank you and your team for the, the hard work that you put in. You know, this was an agreement that a lot of people didn't 
think would necessarily happen anytime soon. There had been challenges getting an agreement done. But, you know, thanks to your leadership, the leadership of Lieutenant Governor Bicewitz, and then I have to acknowledge the great work of your staff, of Secretary McCaw, of Commissioner uh, David Lehman, who just did uh, a tremendous job in negotiating with our tribal partners, as well as uh, your chief of staff, uh, Mr. Mounts, who's on this call. So I, I want to recognize everyone on your team for the great work that was done. Uh, you know, this agreement between the state and our tribal nations really is a, it's a once in a generation pact. It sets our state up to be regionally competitive in this fast growing marketplace of gaming and sports betting that was previously unregulated. Uh, Connecticut Lottery's piece of the agreement really has three main elements. First is the ability to sell existing lottery products online, such as draw tickets, things like Mega Millions and Powerball, uh, our daily numbers games. We'll be able to sell that online uh, through uh, you know mobile apps and other cashless uh, options for people who like to play those games. Secondly, we'll be able to operate one of the three online sports betting platforms that has been authorized by this deal with uh, the tribal nations operating the other two. And then third, uh, the ability to launch up to 15 retail sports betting locations. So bricks and mortar sports books that will be able to stand up around the state. Uh, we're particularly excited about this retail opportunity as we feel it has the potential to create great new entertainment zones and hubs, as well as jobs, uh, especially in Hartford and Bridgeport, where we plan to really focus on creating a significant presence. Uh, Governor, this announcement also is really, as you know, just the beginning of this process. There still needs to be legislation drafted and passed. I know that your team is uh, already getting to work on drafting legislation, uh, and we're hopeful that the legislature will move quickly on that as time is of the essence here as we try to get to market with these products. Uh, the tribal compacts will need to be amended, and those amendments will be, need to be approved by the Federal Department of the Interior. Uh, and then, of course, the, the state will have to create regulations around this. So we'll have to identify what the regulatory body will be that will regulate this new uh, gaming in our state and what those regulations will be. So that all needs to happen before we can actually start taking bets. And that's not going to happen overnight, but we're feeling confident now that we've cleared this really big hurdle of an agreement with the tribes. Um, of course, you know, with additional gaming options in the state, we firmly believe, as I know you do, Governor Lamont, that there needs to be additional resources to assist the small percentage of people who will struggle with problem gambling. Um, you know, we know that it's a very small percentage in our current lottery uh, setup that have struggles with problem uh, gaming, and we want to make sure that we have the resources available to them. We're already in conversations with the Connecticut Council on Problem Gambling about what resources they think they'll need in this new landscape, this digital landscape. And you know, I think the good news is that the online nature of a lot of these new gaming options actually make it easier to both identify and to help people who run into trouble. It's much easier to do that in a digital landscape than it is in, a, in an all cash business. We'll know our customers better. We'll have a better sense of who's having trouble and the ability to help them uh, deal with and get any resources they need to help with any problem gambling. Um, and the last thing I want to say is that, you know, Connecticut Lottery's inclusion in this framework is really great news for Connecticut taxpayers. Over the last five years alone, the Connecticut Lottery has returned more than $1.7 billion to the state's general fund. That includes just over $304 million that we've already contributed to the general fund in the current fiscal year. That was, almost, uh, that was after almost $350 million that we contributed last year. We're well ahead of that pace. We're looking to get to about $400 million this year if we continue on the current pace. And we've generated all of that through brick and mortar establishments, cash purchases alone, uh, our traditional scratch tickets and draw games. So now with our state on the precipice of authorizing online lottery purchases and sports betting, you know, with this new agreement, we really think that this is going to enable Connecticut lottery to significantly grow our contributions to the state. All right. Well said, Rob. Um, any questions? Channel 3 Eyewitness News.
Uh, yes, Governor. Uh, first, a question about uh, the coronavirus. You know, uh, we just wanted to know if we know what percentage of our infections are from the variants right now. I certainly heard um, in New York it could be up to 50 percent. I don't think we really know. We're not really doing as much uh, that sequ- genetic sequences as, as we could. Josh, anything else to add on that? Um, well, we're working a lot with our colleagues at the Yale School of Public Health, and they're uh, doing a lot of sequencing and doing a lot of analysis. They estimate we're probably in the range of 30 to 40 percent of the cases in the state right now are the B117 variant, um, but it's, uh, it is an estimate at this point. Are we, spe- are we specifically doing any testing on the New York variant 1526, and do we have any preliminary numbers from that sequencing? Yeah, I think they are starting to look for that now, and we don't have any cases identified at this point. All right. And my final question, this one will be about uh, sports wagering. Um, You know, we have the March Madness tournament happening right now. And I just wanted to know how we might be navigating the collegiate aspect of all of this. You know, for example, New Jersey and Rhode Island, they prohibit wagers being placed on their college teams. So we just wanted to see how Connecticut might go down that path. Want to take that, Rob? Uh, Yes, thank you for that question. Uh, That is an open question right now in Connecticut. Uh, As you mentioned, different states have taken different approaches. Some states do not allow college betting at all. Some prohibit it on the colleges that are in their state. Some only prohibit it on the colleges that are in their state when those teams are playing at home. Uh, we don't know yet exactly what we're going to do. That's going to be an open question for uh, the, the regulation process and the, the, the legislation and the, the regulations that are drafted. So we're, we don't know yet, but uh, you know, we're certainly going to uh, be keen to follow whatever regulations are passed. Thank you very much. News 8. Good afternoon. Uh, first, for, for Josh, you were quoted um, when it comes to uh, some of the um, – more vulnerable population of making progress not quite there. Kind of a two-part. Once we get all the mobile units out there, will people have, uh, as Hartford Healthcare and Yale is doing, allowing people to choose the vaccine, will people have that choice? And once all those mobile units are out there, do you expect to see a bigger rise in those people getting vaccinated? Sure. Um, well, a couple of things. First of all, people have the choice today in terms of which vaccine. Um, it's it's made visible in the res- reservation process and it, it walk up clinics, which vaccines being administered. Um, but with regards to the mobile units, um, keep in mind, this is just one more um, additional set of resources we're adding. We already have a number of our providers doing um, we, we estimate over a thousand mobile clinics around the state already. Um, and uh, that's at churches, that's at uh, senior housing complexes. So this is going to be another fleet of resources that we can deploy very quickly and flexibly, um, you know, in the, in the next month and a half to help address the remaining kind of prioritized populations. By the time we get to the late spring, the summer, we're going to have more vaccine than we're going to have people who want to take it. So we envision these um, mobile units operating almost on an ice cream truck model where you can drive through neighborhoods and you can flag them down and get a vaccination or they can go park at a popular, you know, a food truck uh, or a festival. Um, so we're just going to try, we, we're anticipating a future and then, you know, very soon where everyone who wants a vaccine uh, has already gotten one. And now we have to make it as absolutely easy as we possibly can for everyone else um, to, to get vaccinated. We're going to, as the governor mentioned, we're going to have additional supports for um, local communities that we'll be announcing as well. Uh, this is a community-led effort, and so many of our communities have already done a fantastic job of doing outbound calling, uh, doing walk-up clinics, doing door-to-door canvassing. And so we're going to be providing more resources uh, through our Department of Public Health to help further ramp up those efforts. And for the governor, um, earlier in the month, uh, you said that Connecticut has earned the ability to roll back capacity and so on and so forth. Uh, Today, uh, Rochelle Walensky uh, indicated that she has concerns about the states that maybe the numbers didn't uh, indicate that, but still uh, open things up a little bit too soon. Uh, If the numbers do go up at all, do you have a point where... um, relative to what she said, where you would think that, well, maybe if we hit four or five percent or six percent, we're going to need to rethink this. 
Yeah, I think she was really concerned about those states like Texas that have an infection rate that's much higher than ours, opened everything up, and then uh, sort of dismissed wearing the mask and uh, social distancing. Um, that's not Connecticut. We've kept our um, capacity very low, and we're wearing the mask. So I think that was the, the bigger issue there. And as I've said before, I'm a little less focused on the positivity rate, a lot more focused uh, in terms of, in particular, hospitalizations, making sure we continue to have capacity there, making sure our strategy is working, which is um, vaccinate those who are most vulnerable, make sure um, they don't have to be hospitalized, make sure our, we keep our fatalities at a minimum. And so far, I think it's working pretty well. NBC, Connecticut. Hi, Governor Matt Austin with NBC Connecticut. I was wondering yeah. if you could just provide an update um, in terms of federal resources that might be coming to the state to help with the vaccination effort, like FEMA trailers and stuff like that. Um, are there updates on any other um, efforts the feds are going to be doing here? Do um, you want to take that, Josh, as regards what type of federal support we're getting specifically for testing, vaccination, and the such? Yes, there, there is extensive federal support available already through um, prior um, federal uh, grant programs through uh, the CDC, which we're taking advantage of. Um, and there's also a significant additional funds in the uh, American Recovery Plan Act, uh, which passed uh, recently, uh, that we're awaiting more guidance on how we can utilize. But we're not letting that slow us down, as we just discussed, in terms of ramping up additional efforts to make vaccines as readily available to everyone around the state as possible. So we, we're confident we have a lot of resources um, to deploy, and uh, we're looking forward to continuing to work with our local partners to do so. And just in terms of these vans that will be going out to certain sites, how will people know where they will be and do they need to sign up? Sure. So, again, this is all in local partnerships. So what, what, the way this will frequently work will be, um, you know, a church, for example, will want to have a vaccination clinic and they'll help notify their congregation and, and, and help do the outreach. And we'll make sure that the van is there to do the vaccinations. Um, and so it's a community partnership, working with community leaders, community organizations, um, and just bringing that, that van directly into that, uh, that uh, area and make it very simple for people to get their vaccine. Okay, thank you. Fox 61. Hi, Governor. We've heard from health officials. Dr. Coe even said this last week that in order to achieve herd immunity to COVID-19, we would need around 70 to 80 percent of our population vaccinated with April 5th opening the door to everyone who wants a vaccine. Do you think we will achieve that percentage here in Connecticut specifically? I think by April 5th, um, well, first of all, April 5th, we open the vaccine to everybody, regardless of age. So it'll probably take another month or two before we get up to those type of numbers. And, and to be blunt about it, it's going to get tougher and tougher. You may have um, some younger people who aren't quite as uh, eager to um, get vaccinated. There we're going to have to do work. There we're going to have to do the outreach. That's why we have these mobile vans uh, taking it to you. Uh, so, and, and as I said before, um, maybe we only have 36% uh, vaccinated to date, but Look at the number of people who've been previously infected. So um, that could mean that we're getting closer to that number than we know right now. News 12, Connecticut. WTIC 1080 News. Hi, Governor. Dr. Scott Gottlieb of Westport, as you like to point out, um, was talking this weekend about the intensity of the New York variant in New York, Brooklyn, Queens in particular. And New York was a precursor uh, the first time around for what happened here last March in April. What's he telling you as far as those variants? And if it's in New York, are we going to see the same kind of thing again here? Yeah, that's a great question, Dave. Um we, we've talked about that a fair amount. Um, you do have the variant there. It is um, not community spread. It's not like those numbers are going up broadly. But as you point out, there are several communities where it has uh, spiked up. Right now, it looks like that the vaccines uh, still work pretty well. 
I think one of the things that's helping in New York will help in Connecticut is the number of people we have uh, been vaccinated, the number of people who um, have already had antibodies from previous infections. So, yeah, I'm watching that closely. So far, uh, the numbers uh, bear out our strategy, and I think we we're ahead of this variant. We'll be okay. And we've talked a lot about convincing black and brown Americans to get their vaccines. Some of the polls that came out last week were saying much more likely to deny vaccines are white male Republicans. Who's convincing them to get on board? Well, I'm really glad that um, uh, former President Trump uh, spoke out the other day and said it's the right thing to do. And um, look, we politicize masks. We cannot politicize vaccinations. I mean, vaccinations keep you safe and to keep everybody you come into contact safe. So I, I really got to believe that... Um, over a period of time, there'll be enough peer pressure that you want to do this. My instinct is that um, there may be some restaurants that at some point say, hey, I only want people coming in who have been vaccinated. I see our first our Carnival cruise, or one of the cruise liners is uh, setting sail in a week. That's for only people who have been vaccinated. So I think they're going to find different ways people realize it's the right thing to do, get on with it. The Associated Press. Hello, everybody. Um, Governor, um, the Department of Correction uh, says about one third of prison inmates are not taking the vaccine or refusing the vaccine. Have you had any recent discussions with Commissioner Kiros about how to improve that rate? Um, my hope is a little like um, nurses at nursing homes and hospitals. Um, the first pass, a lot of people said, maybe I, I, I don't want to be the very first person to do it. We went uh, through a second time three or four weeks later, and twice as many people got vaccinated. So I'd like to think that what's going on, say, in the correctional facilities is not a political statement. It was just some hesitancy, and I'd like to think we're going to be catching up and getting close to 100 percent vaccinations pretty soon. Do you know if those numbers have increased, um, or do you have any information about inmates who first refused and then uh, decided to get it after all? Josh, do you have any input on that? Well, they're still working their way through on the first pass. And, and um, you know, I, I turn the, the statement around. I think, you know, over 70 percent uptake, you know, when first offered uh, is, is a good first step. Um, and I think that is a credit to Commissioner Kiros and his team who, while we were waiting for vaccines to come, were already doing a lot of education and a lot of um, work with the offender population to ensure that they understood that the vaccines are extremely safe and, and highly effective. Um, and so it's a good start, And but there will be more opportunities, um, and we, we hope that those numbers will go up further. Thank you. Connecticut Public Media. Good afternoon. Um, I just want to make sure I'm correct on this. You said 80,000 people signed up on Friday with the new um, age bracket for vaccinations. I think 80,000 in that age group have um, signed up to date. Is that right, Josh? Right. Since, since Friday. So Friday and then through the weekend. Okay. And, and how did that go with the VAM system and the local pharmacies? Do you know when um, people are scheduled, when they're the latest vaccination date was scheduled for in that age group so far? Well, providers were only supposed to have opened up schedules to um, the middle of, um, of April. Um, but the thing for people to keep in mind, particularly of people who are still looking for appointments, our providers are putting more appointments out every day, um, particularly early in the week when they find out what their allocation is going to be as we cascade the news down from the federal government. Um, so I'd encourage people just to keep looking each day um, if you're still looking for a slot. New ones are opening all the time, and we remain confident that we are very much on track to uh, get everyone an appointment uh, by the time we change the next phase on uh, April 5th. Is anything going to be done differently, or are you learning from this week, or last week, I should say, for the next age group when it opens up to everyone? Well, I, I think what we've learned is that we're timing these transitions um, quite well. Um, you know, as, as said before, our goal is not to make sure that everyone who comes eligible can get an appointment that day. If we were to do that, the consequence would be the prior phase 
um, would take much longer than it needs to, and we'd have unused appointment slots starting to pop up all around the state. So our goal is to really, as soon as we start to see uh, slacking and demand from the prior phase to move immediately to the next phase. And I think we really nailed that this time, um, as I think we, uh, we've we continued to learn from prior phases where we've got it pretty good as well. But again, I think we're well on track for April 5th along that, that same modeling. Thank you. The Day of New London. Hi, Governor. Um, I'm wondering how the vaccination of teachers and school staff is going. Um, has there been any level of hesitancy to get the vaccine among that group? My understanding is that the vaccine has been offered to virtually every educator in the state. The vast majority have had their first shot. Uh, I'm sure there's still some hesitancy, as there's been in all groups. But um, our experience has been once the first group has got it and they tell their friend, hey, it's OK, um, I didn't really have many side effects and I feel a lot better. and I feel liberated. Um, I think you'll find the overwhelming majority of educators are vaccinated within a few weeks. The Waterbury Republican American. The Waterbury Republican American. Yeah. Sorry about that, Max. Uh, little operator error. Um, do we know how many of the fully vaccinated? Can you give us a breakdown between uh, Johnson and Johnson and the other two vaccinations? There's what about oh, five hundred some odd thousand, I think, this today. Um, sure. So uh, on, on that chart, we had 38,578 Johnson & Johnson doses administered. So that's one and done. So those are fully vaccinated. Um, and then the 584,000 uh, uh, fully vaccinated, including the J&J. &J. So about uh, 540,000 fully vaccinated on the, the mRNA vaccines. And Josh, when you talked about the 30 to 40 percent estimate regarding the B117 variant, do we know, um, I guess, how prevalent it might be among um, black and uh, Latino and other minority communities? Or is that we haven't broken out that info yet? Do not have it broken out that way, no. OK. And uh, Governor, uh, today there was a, a vote in the Commerce Committee to um, require, well, not require, well, I guess it's require when possible uh, five days notice of any emergency declarations or uh, orders related to such declarations that affect uh, business operations. Um, you've been you've given some notice varying degrees of notice in the past uh, most recently uh, a couple of weeks notice of the, the reopening uh, relaxations that took place on Friday. So I was just wondering if you have any thoughts on that. I think it's prudent. As you point out, Paul, we generally try to give at least two weeks notice, give people a chance to prepare going forward. So um, I'm happy to have that uh, additional guidance. Okay. Or, and, and I'm sorry, I might have missed it. When do we expect those additional 35 vans to be deployed? I think you'll see them by uh, early, mid-April. That's right. Okay. They're going to be uh, getting ramped up and deployed uh, through the month of April. Okay, thanks very much. Hearst, Connecticut Media. Uh, good afternoon. The uh, state's regulation review process can be somewhat slow. Uh, I guess when is, when is the idea that uh, sports and online gambling can start? Yeah, Robert, Paul, do you want to take that? Yeah. Um, well, I think one of the things that we're going to look to do is try to codify as much through the legislative process as possible um, to ensure that we can have um, expedient uh, regulation uh, approval and go through that process. I think, Nick, you're really referring to the current regulation review process that can take close to a year, uh, but we will be looking to accelerate that through the legislative process. It is our hope to have uh, if the legislature moves quickly on this legislation, uh, allowing us to be able to send the compact amendments to Department of Interior, uh, Bureau of Indian Review uh, Affairs, that uh, by time at the start of football season in the fall, we should be uh, up and running here in Connecticut. And now that you have an agreement, uh, do 
you have any plan to adjust your revenue targets, maybe higher and sooner, realizing that revenue? We, we will be doing that review um, as it, um, and be able to provide that as part of a, a sufficient fiscal note to the legislature once we uh, fully put forth uh, the legislation codifying uh, the compact amendment and the agreement uh, to the legislature. Thanks, well, uh, just, the oh, Nick's sorry. a wild card in the pack, of course, is uh, how fast, you know, A, the legislature gets their bill passed, but probably the one we have less control over is Department of uh, Interior. like to think we can expedite that, so we're being hesitant on adding all the revenues at this point. Thanks, and uh, just one question on vaccines. Uh, any insight into what the allocation from the federal government might be for the next couple weeks? Uh, I'm told it's going to ramp up... Um, Moderately in the next week and uh, a lot in early April, probably getting up over 200,000 doses uh, for that uh, April 5th reopening of, to all age groups. Thanks. The Hartford Current. Hey, everybody. This is Emily Brindley from The Current. Um, first question. Uh, so Connecticut right now ranks seventh um, in infections or new cases per capita. That's seventh in the country. Um, I was wondering, obviously, Connecticut does more testing than some other states, but that has been true throughout most of the pandemic. So I was wondering if, um, Governor, you might be able to speak about why we might be ranking so high right now and, and what the state could be doing differently or uh, could be doing in the future to to get us off of that, uh, that high ranking list. Yeah, I got to take a look at that, Emily. I mean, I look at Florida, Texas, some Georgia, some of these states that I thought had a much higher infection rate. You're right. If, if it's a number of people who have tested positive per 100,000, it is impacted by the fact that we are doing a lot more testing than others. And then uh, you're right, though. Um, this is no time for us to relax. We're looking at New York. We're looking at a Massachusetts. Things have ticked up a little bit there. But as I've said before, I'm a little less anxious about the positivity rate unless I saw a big ramp up. I'm really focused on the hospitalizations right now. And I should clarify that I was talking about new case rate per capita, uh, not positivity rate there. But Connecticut is seventh now. And um, I know that we've been doing a lot of testing. But as I said, that has been true throughout the course of the pandemic. So it, it does seem like there would be something else at play right now. Can you speak to, to what might be at play outside of yeah. Connecticut high testing rate? Um, let me get back to you on that. My instinct is that um, we're keeping up a lot of testing. A lot of other states are doing much, much less testing. There's much less demand for testing right now. Josh, do you have anything to add to this? No, I think that's right. So you're saying that it's entirely because of our testing rates? I, I, I'm not sure that I follow you on that because we know that Connecticut does do a lot of testing, but that has been true throughout most of the pandemic, and Connecticut has not always ranked so high on the new case the new case rate yeah. per capita. I think I got to get back to you on that, Emily. Um, I'm just uh, hypothesizing right now that other states are doing much less testing, so they have a, a lower infection count per 100,000. But let, I'm guessing at this point. So let me just take a look at that. I owe you a better response than that. All right. I appreciate that. And then I also wanted to ask if uh, the state has the new target for the um, equity percentages. I know that that would change when the eligibility expanded on, on Friday. Um, no, we'll, we'll publish that on Thursday when we uh, update the, the weekly metrics on the, the equity goals. Okay, and then one last question. Governor, I wonder if you could speak to, uh, you mentioned at the beginning of the, at the beginning of your comments, your, you know, kind of concern about people who are spring break partying maybe in Florida. Do you have any concern about that for, for Connecticut college students? I, I know a lot of schools have postponed spring break, but even outside of that, any concern about people traveling while they're remote learning? And, and what would your message be to those people? Uh, my message would be, um, if you don't have to travel, stay home. It's a pretty nice uh, time of the year here in Connecticut. Um, if you have to travel, I just assume you don't go down to Miami Beach. I know it could be, looks like it's pretty hopping for spring break. There's also a real risk of a flare-up there. Um, we don't need that. And if you do go down, you don't listen, and you come back, get tested. Get tested. It just will reduce the risk for yourself, your family, your community, and sit back until you get the results of that test. That's what I'd ask, Emily. Thanks for asking that. All right. Thank you all. Appreciate it. CT News Junkie. Thanks, Max. Uh, Governor, any change or news on the extension of the emergency powers executive order front? 
Uh, yeah, I, I've been told by um, Nora Danahy, our new general counsel, that um, if we're going to continue to receive that FEMA funding at 100%, uh, we've got to get the emergency declaration renewed. And Paul, what's the schedule on that with the legislature? Sorry about that, Governor. Um, yeah, thank you, Governor. Uh, in terms of the schedule, there's been uh, conversations with uh, the legislature. We gave them an update, gave them an overview uh, based upon our overall research of what's necessary. Uh, the one thing that we did let them know is that uh, every state is still currently um, have uh, emergency powers or emergency declaration to allow them to be able to have access to federal funding, particularly the FEMA funding. And uh, we, we look forward to continuing those conversations with the legislature. I know that they uh, will be coming in uh, to take on some items uh, tomorrow. We're not 100% certain of what that will be, uh, but we have uh, provided them an overview of uh, what would be necessary um, as part of the previous conversations the governor had with them uh, last week. Okay. Um, pharmacists, I guess, are, are concerned that there's an executive order that allows them to vaccinate, uh, you know, adults, kids against the flu and the coronavirus for the adults uh, that would expire on April 20th. Is that one of the ones you guys will look to expand? Because I guess the legislature is not acting there at, at this time, at least. As, as the governor has always stated that there are many essential executive orders uh, to uh, allow us to be able to fully vaccinate the residents of the state of Connecticut. Uh, that's a perfect example of one. As, as the governor has stated clearly, an emergency uh, declaration powers uh, end on the 20th. Uh, and as we went through the session, the legislature, uh, if they were against or for various orders, could have uh, taken them up. Uh, but we uh, provide them an overview of, of, of an example of some orders this being one of them, uh, that's important for the overall public health and uh, emergency response. Okay. Um, did you guys meet with the Republicans yet in that? We we are we have currently not met, met with the Republicans, but we will be in conversations with the Republicans. Gotcha. Uh, you said, Josh, you said earlier that uh, thirty between thirty and forty percent of the cases now you think of the B one one seven variant. Do we have any any figures on the other? variants that have been prevalent or we've seen here um at this point I, I think the the estimates from the team at yale is that the b117 is the predominant uh variant um you know on an upward slope uh moving past those numbers you just quoted um the the numbers of the others uh seem to be relatively small at this point um and so we'll continue to publish those data um in the thursday uh, metrics report as we started doing last week do we project that at some point um, the B117 is going to become the dominant strain of the coronavirus here? Well, Dr. Fauci predicted that was going to happen in the country um, a couple of months ago. And, and um, you know, it seems like in many parts of the country, including Connecticut, that that's the, the trend line that we're on right now. But do we have a date where that might where we think that that might be? Um, the modeling from the team at Yale expected by the end of uh, by the end of March. We're almost there. Um, so maybe it goes into next month. Um, but I think Dr. Fauci's prediction a couple months ago was end of March. Okay. Thank you. The Connecticut Mirror. Hey, everyone. Uh, when you opened up eligibility, or you said eligibility would be opened up to everyone on April 5th, you mentioned prioritization for people with underlying conditions. Um, has the state uh, come to a determination on how you'll define the comorbidity? Uh, and do you have any more information about the primary uh, care physician's role. Hi, thanks, Jenna. Um, so th this is really something that we've looked to the, the hospitals um, to, to think about, and, and it's really going to be a, a very limited list of severely, um, you know, very severe conditions um, that they're going to look to bring in. And, and in those cases, they're because of the nature of, you know, the, the level of severity and the risk associated with that, they're, uh, we believe um, they're going to be exclusively people who are already have a relationship with one of one of our hospitals, acute care hospitals around the state, and that's likely where you know they would be uh, brought in and, and, and you know ensure that they're kind of towards the front of that that last phase. Um, people who are under 45 with have one of those very severe conditions, but this is something that the hospitals are going to be uh, leading, um, and we'll have more guidance, uh, or they will have more guidance on that as we get closer to that April 5th date. 
So they'll submit something to the state and the state will then circulate it to all the providers? It, it's not going to be that formal. The providers are collaborating amongst themselves um, to think about what the, that small number would be. They're, they are in you know, discussions with Commissioner Gifford, and uh, you know, that's something that we're looking to firm up over the you know, next week or so as we get closer to April 5th. Okay, thanks. All right, I guess I'm getting this uh, signal. Um, Rob, thank you for joining us today. Uh, you're going to be a very busy guy for the, the foreseeable future. I'll spare you any... Um, it's a roll of the dice, it's a good bet type of analogies, and just say uh, right now, it's, I think it's going to be a good spring. We're making really great progress uh, on the vaccine. Maintain your diligence. Uh, skip Miami Beach. Look forward to talking to you on Thursday.